Hello everyone, Jared here, and in today's video, we're leaving Guiyang for our next city, Kaili. We are leaving Guiyang for Kaili today, and I'm feeling much better than I was yesterday. Good to know that medication actually works. Didn't use the Chinese traditional cough syrup, what was it, city? I don't remember. Anyways, I've had it before, and not necessarily when you have two other Western medications as well that you know work. And thankfully, with that out of the way, I was no longer going to be sick any more times on this trip. Anyways, we headed out on the train for about a half hour's ride east to Kaili before we arrived at the station. Just arrived at Kaili Station, and right behind me, as soon as we get off, we get some nice architecture of the Dong minority. This is hopefully a good sign of what's to come. And I came to regret those words almost immediately, as there was a stark weather change. made a change of plans because of weather. It said it was going to be really hot in the water town in Fenghuang and Zhangjiajie. So we decided we would actually change course for our plans for the vacation, the remainder of it, and instead we're going to go down to a town called Zhaoxing after hearing Kaili, and then we will go from there to Guilin. But during the half hour we were inside the station, it went from being partly cloudy to downpour and thunderstorms and hopefully the rain stops really soon. But, unfortunately for us, the weather would not change until after we got to the taxi. So, we got to get drenched in the meantime while we tried to get one. Once we got into the taxi, we headed off towards Kylie proper, and the sky cleared on up as we made our way to the hotel to drop off our things. And, once we finally did, we started to walk around and noticed that the signs here were very interesting because this was the first time we saw anything that was designed in a way that promoted one of the minority's cultures. As you can see here with this sign for Ningbo Lu, the street, and also on top of these bus stations. But that wasn't all. Many of the sidewalks also had lots of designs representing aspects of the Miao minority's culture. And there was also this funny image too. Mistranslations are always great. So, we walked away a little bit from our hotel and ended up at this place, a museum that was supposed to focus on the Miao minority group here in Kaili City. I was really looking forward to seeing what they offered here, but it appeared by what we could tell that it might actually be closed, since there was so much construction going on. Uh, we might be lucky. So we just got inside the museum, it was free to come on in, and apparently, uh, there's not really much AC, but it appears to be the opening of an exhibit today. And right in front of us we have people signing their names on the board. I don't know why. Maybe it's just something that people do when an exhibit opens. This is a month and a half long exhibit. Let's take a look at what there is here today. We noticed immediately that they were offering these free books, which included lots of the artwork that was featured on the exhibit that was here for a short time. And after a quick glance through that book, we were asked to come on up to the board and sign our names, which we then proceeded to do before heading off to look at the exhibit. At the entrance to the exhibit, they also included a brief description of the artist, as well as a list of his education and accomplishments. But right after that was all of his works. Immediately, we were really surprised by the quality of these oil paintings, and rather than say anything about them, I'm just going to let you enjoy looking at them. So, I hope you enjoyed that preview of what was here. Once we headed back out, they seemed to be setting up for some performance, since there were so many women dressed in traditional Miao minority costumes. But, it appears that they were just going to stand next to this sign, and instead, 
All that was happening on the stage in front was a man giving a description about the artist before the artist came on to speak for himself. So, rather than stick around and listen to any more of that, we decided we'd head off and check out the rest of the museum about the Qiandongnan region, which is otherwise known as the Miaowandong Minority Autonomous Region. There was a map here showing all the different areas in the provinces and what they look like, including which ones held which minorities within. And there was also a lot of history here as well, that talked about the development of the region, and more particularly, the Kaili area, including events such as the Miao's Uprising War, which occurred during the Tongzhi period, or mid to late 1800s, that lasted for 18 years, before moving on to the Olympic Relay Torch, which they happen to have here on display. It's the Olympic Torch from 2008. I'd never seen one of these in person before, and it was really special to be able to see it here. So, after that, it was time for us to head on up to the second floor of the museum, where there was a lot more about each of the minorities that was here. So once again, we are entering a museum exhibit that is about the ethnic minorities here in China, but this time, these are from the southeast part of Guizhou and also the southeast part of Hunan province. And here is a map of the distribution of the various populations throughout China. Here they included information about stories and folklore of the Miao minority, as well as this, the 100 portraits of the Miao, painted by Chen Hao during the Qing dynasty. And looking around and reading about all of these different stories, as well as looking at the depictions of art therein, really made me wish that there were English copies of these stories for people who are not from China to be able to read as well. And moving on from there, we came across this section dedicated to housing of the minority groups that lived within this Qian Dongnan region, such as the Miao and Dong, the Han and Buyi, the Shui, Yao, Zhuang, Tujia, and the list goes on of the various groups that live in this part of China. Many of these groups live in areas where it was necessary for wooden houses to be built on these wooden poles, where the first floor functions as a barn, and the second floor is where the actual living spaces or residences are. Many houses for these minorities still look like this today, although not all of them follow this same design. We would be going to one of these villages the very next day, so if you want to know what a traditional Miao village looks like, then you'll just have to come back next time to see what the village looks like then. But anyways, there was also an exhibit that highlighted the intricate wood carving of the ethnic minorities here, as well as wooden artifacts that were used in, and continue to still be used today, for various aspects of the minority group's lives. Probably one of my favorite exhibits that they had on the minorities here, was about the various festivals, such as the Sisters Festival, but there were many other celebrations and festivities that were included in the images that they provided here, many of which I had no idea about, as they didn't include any descriptions. I couldn't believe, though, the size of this really long table at which everyone was having a hot pot meal, and I felt that, if I got the chance, I needed to know more about this. They also had information about love and marriage among the minority groups, and even included a snippet from a movie that focuses on the Miao minority, which highlights boys trying to woo the women. I thought it was neat that they were including this in the movie, since I'd never seen a movie about the Miao minority before. But clearly, she wasn't a fan of what he was trying to do here in this video. Plenty of other festivities took place in the images that they included here, but unfortunately, there weren't descriptions for all of them, and I really wish they had more information about this dragon boat, which I was seeing here for the second time now, after we saw it for the very first time in the museum back in Guiyang. I believe this is just the Miao version of the boats used during the dragon boat racing for the dragon boat festival, but if anyone knows any more, please let me know in the comments down below. There was also this wall nearby, which listed all the different holidays and special events that occur among the minority groups in the Qiandongnan region. Unfortunately for us, we weren't going to be here for any of them, but if you happen to be in the area when you're traveling around China, then it might be a good idea for you to go ahead and look some of these events on up, just to make sure that you're not missing out on anything special. Following this was a small section on the religious beliefs of the Dong minority, including the depictions of various spirits and gods, and these worshipping bridges, 
which is where families go to send messages to past ancestors, and they toss off offerings in hopes that it will bring them good fortune. A couple of other things that are worth mentioning that happen to be on this floor too were some exhibits highlighting the weavings and wooden crafts, as well as ink stones made and used by the minority groups here. Before we headed off to the third and final floor. The last section on the top floor of the museum, the third floor, is the embroidery and jewelry, of course, where all the best things are. And when I say the best things, I really mean it, because the embroidery work that they have here is exquisite. Initially, what we see is just more modern renditions of embroidery that are placed in portraits. But as we move along, they swiftly change to displays of more traditional handcrafted and dyed embroidery. Probably one of the neatest things about this was being able to see how they get the patterns into some of these dyed artworks. Through using these boards that have the design already cut out, they're able to save a lot of time and just flip the design from one side to the next. And that's how they're able to get what you see here. There was a lot of variation in the embroidery. Some of it really popped out in a very 3D fashion, while others were a bit more traditional in their design, but were still rather intricate as you can see through the close-up right here. I don't know how people are able to do this, particularly the hand-stitched embroidery. A lot of this is not done with a loom or paper stencil to support it, so they weave vertical and horizontal threads until eventually creating the images that you see before you, of various religious symbols and totems, stories and spirits, or maybe even animals that all have symbolic meanings for the minority groups here. And this embroidery wasn't just limited to small pieces of cloth. A lot of this would also go on a lot of the clothing that you can see is highlighted in this exhibit as well. There are many kinds of colorful meow costumes, and they are all different in terms of decorations, patterns, and textures, all with their own unique meanings. Butterflies, centipedes, maple leaves, for example, are apparently closely related to the historic origins of the meow. Some patterns are concerned with the migration of the Miao from ancient times, as they moved their way from northern China to the south. Patterns like horses or bars decorated on pleated skirts tell the stories of the Miao's ancestors fighting on horses. Thus, in many ways, one might be able to call the Miao costumes history books on the body. There are a variety of different Miao groups, such as the Red Miao, White Miao, Black Miao, and Flowery Miao, all with their own unique ornaments as well as designs. Although ultimately, according to the way Beijing has categorized them, there are five forms and 21 styles of Miao clothing which are distinguished further by dialect and region in the way that they are depicted in clothing. But remember, it's not just the clothing that's unique and diverse, it's also the jewelry, like you see here. And rather than say more, I'll just go ahead and let you enjoy this final section of the exhibit.
And so, having finished that last exhibit, we headed on down out of the museum, stepped out into the blinding sun and really humid weather, and walked our way back towards the hotel. We walked around for a bit, seeing what was nearby on the city streets, but aside from this man who was doing calligraphy with his fingers, there wasn't really anything much of interest. So, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video of our first day here in Kaili, and next time, we're off to this place, Xijiang Miao Village, where we get to experience what life's like among the Miao minority in one of its most famous villages in China. So, I hope you look forward to seeing it. Until next time. Thank you again for watching this video. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you have not already done so. Also, please share this channel with others so we can make the channel grow together as I continue to put out more videos.